The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Matt from Island Press, and welcome to a special webinar with our friends at Next City, uh, featuring author and land use lawyer Chuck Wolf and Next City president, CEO, and publisher Tom D'Alessio. Uh, Tom will be our moderator today, and we'll be taking a closer look at Chuck's new book, Seeing the Better City. Uh, which was published last month by Island Press. Um, so I think Chuck and Tom, they're going to have a really nice discussion about the book, and uh, we hope to show you guys how uh, Chuck's approach to uh, observation and uh, photography could be really useful and um, even fun as you, you know, explore and enjoy your cities and maybe even help you change things for the better. I want to start... If I can get the slide, there we go. I want to start by just giving you a quick look at the agenda. Um, I'll introduce Tom in a minute. And Tom and Chuck will have a kind of a brief intro chat. Uh, and then Chuck will give uh, about a 15 minute overview of the book uh, with slides. So he'll do a presentation. After that, Tom and Chuck will have another brief discussion. Uh, and then we'll open it up to your uh, questions. So you can use the question uh, function or question field in the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, to type the question. Uh, we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for this, uh, and we'll try to get to as many as we can, so I encourage you to submit your questions. And uh, everyone on the call today, or the webinar, can save 20% on seeing the better city. Uh, just go to islandpress.org and use the promo code 4WOLF at checkout. Um, Next City members can actually save 30% on the book uh, in all Island Press books, in fact. So that's actually one of the great perks of being a Next City member. Um, members should have a separate promo code for the 30% discount. Um, that's, I think that's listed either on your member page at nextcity.org. Um, if you are a member and you don't have this code, um, just let me know, and I'll be sure to connect you with someone who can help you out. Um, and if you're not a member, and you'd like to take advantage of all the perks listed on the screen, uh, you can go to nextcity.org uh, slash membership to learn more. Uh, it's really worth it, and it helps Next City continue uh, you know, to do all the great work that they're doing. Uh, and also, if you support their spring membership drive at the $60 level, you'll get a free copy of uh, Seeing the Better City. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Tom D'Alessio. Tom is... Uh, president, CEO, and publisher of Next City. Uh, before joining the organization in 2015, he directed the Center for Resilient Design at the College of Architecture and Design at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, prior to that, he ran the Regional Plan Association's New Jersey office and served as a senior advisor on land use for two New Jersey governors. Tom is a licensed professional planner and a member of the American Institute of certified planners, uh, as well as being an adjunct professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, where he teaches land use planning and infrastructure planning. So with that, I would like to pass it over to Tom. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Island Press, for this wonderful opportunity. Next City is thrilled to kick off what we hope will be a number of webinars uh, that will be available to our members and to others. So we do encourage people to go to our website, nextcity.org, and find out a bit more about us as well as these opportunities. Uh, for those that may not know, Next City is a nonprofit organization with a mission to inspire social, economic, and environmental change in cities through journalism and events. And we're thrilled to be able to produce uh, major events such as this, as well as Vanguard and other activities to inspire change. And of course, uh, we produce daily and weekly posts all about changes in cities around the country and around the world. We started in 2002 um, producing a quarterly news magazine, and um, we actually uh, are now online, and you can read not only our posts, but also uh, access our eBooks and other information that include op-eds, uh, long-form features, and news posts on everything from infrastructure to equitable development to culture and social change. So uh, we appreciate, again, the collaboration, and we look forward to future collaborations with Island Press. I am especially pleased to be able to introduce Charles R. R. Wolf and uh, to introduce Chuck to talk a bit about seeing the better city. 
Chuck Wolf provides a unique perspective about cities as both a longtime writer about urbanism worldwide and as an attorney in Seattle, where he focuses on land use law and environmental law. He is also a principal advisor at Seeing Better Cities Group and an affiliate associate professor in the College of Built Environments at the University of Washington, where he teaches land use law at the graduate level. Wolf is an avid traveler, photographer, and writer, and con contributes on urban development topics to several publications, including the City Lab, The Atlantic, The Huffington Post, Grist.org, SeattlePI.com, and Crosscut.com. He blogs at MyUrbanist.com. His first book, Urbanism Without Effort, was published in electronic form by Island Press in 2013. Um, audience, please, let's welcome Chuck Wolf. Chuck, you Excellent. have a really interesting background. Tell us a bit about why a land use attorney is so interested in seeing the better city. Good question, at first instance, anyway. Um, as, as I explain right off in the book, I'm actually the son of, a, of an urban planning professor. And so a lot of the things that I like to write about when I'm not being a lawyer are uh, really things that I garnered when I was quite young through my dad's work. I got a great opportunity to travel with him as I was growing up. And so what happened, in short, is many of the lessons of my childhood started to percolate back as I was practicing law. And um, so I think I had a relatively unique opportunity to contrast a lot of things that um, I saw on the job with things that I learned growing up. and. While I did have a master's in planning along the way before I went to law school, this really didn't start to, to come out in a major way till about 2009. So as with everything that we're going to talk about today, things are not always as they seem, and don't judge things by your first glance. <laughs> Absolutely. And I have to tell you, um, I was thrilled to be able to read through your book and to find a lot of uh, helpful pointers. Um, one of the points that you talk about in the book is about technology. How has technology made observing change easier or harder? If I have the prerogative to change your question slightly, I would have said, how has technology made observing easier and harder at the same time? Um, this book is about art, science, and both. And I think that technology has helped direct the efficiencies and of, 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 of working with cities and understanding them um, in a very uh, equitable way. I want to be really clear about that. And chapter five of the book talks almost exclusively about that. However, along the way, we risk losing our fundamental human senses, all five of them, most importantly, the visual sense. And so the book is a very, very purposeful attempt to balance both technology and the humanistic. And I'm trying to do um, something that I, that I hope is fairly unique, because we've had a lot of books on urban observation. They have a lot of fascination with technology today, but um, I'm trying to marry them both. And I appreciate that you spend time in the book considering the subjectivity of seeing. Planners and designers are more likely to accept this approach. But what do you say to your fellow attorneys and to regulators who are more used to words than photos? Um, good question. And uh, all kidding aside, depending on context, I often say exactly the same thing that I would say to the first cohort that you reference. And I've actually started to do talks to lawyers about the importance of seeing. And guess what? They like it, generally speaking. Um, I think the most direct answer to your question is when it makes sense, um, both the humanistic, again, the humanistic, the evidentiary, and the techno technological should be married together. And so um, I really try to, the more, the more empirical side, the more evidentiary side, open people's eyes, no pun intended, 
to the humanistic side. It's not always possible. We're all in professional situations where that could well be inappropriate. But um, I try the best I can, and one virtue of getting a little bit older is I may have some judgment about when to do it. <laughs> and we're all getting older as we speak, as we go through. But uh, Chuck, if you wouldn't mind, we'd love to have you give a presentation on the book, and then we'll have a couple of follow-up questions. And then we'll also ask uh, folks that are participating in the webinar to feel free to uh, write down any questions they may have, and we'll go through those also. Okay, thanks. I'm going to um, gain control of the screen here um, and then maximize the PowerPoint and get rolling. Um, may take a minute, but here we go. Um, so I'm going to try and, within 15 or 20 minutes, tell you all about the book and go to some pointed questions that Tom might have asked if this were a pure radio show interview. because. Um, even Tom's questions so far anticipate a lot of what I'm going to talk about for a moment here, or for 15 moments. So more than a walk, a visual toolkit to manage urban change, very purposeful um, choice of words uh, by yours truly in titling this presentation, um, honoring uh, something that uh, Next Cities reporter Jen Kinney did in her article about the book, which was tremendous, um, even as an objective person. I think it was March 2nd, and so the audience really ought to check that out. Not because it's talking about the book, because but because Jen tested it out, tested out some of the techniques, and it was an honor to see someone do that and write about it. Um, this opening photo is in South Lake Union in Seattle, and many of you know that this is ground zero for urban change in the United States with Paul Allen's real estate company and Amazon really redeveloping a part of our downtown in a very major way so that our city is very, very different than it was even 10, 20 years before. And this photo evokes something that happened two years ago when I walked the uh, editor of Planning Magazine, Megan Stromberg, across this area when everyone was here for the American Planning Association in April. And then I sat down and I met with Lee Einsweiler, who may even be on the call. Lee is a well-known planning consultant who operates out of Austin, Texas. But at that point, he was heading up the uh, effort to recode LA, as the project is called, the redo of the Los Angeles Zoning Ordinance. And we talked about the role of photography in regulatory drafting and public participation. And quite frankly, Lee referred to this photo and he said, Chuck, you've got to keep taking these kinds of photos because they show us the city we want to see. And I said, really? Because not everybody would agree that equity um, of all sorts is shown in this photo. And we went back and forth and we talked about what the book title might be. And we came up with Seeing the Better City. So kudos to Lee for helping me with that. And um, that's why that photo is, is very, very important to start with. As I said um, in answering Tom's question, I really want this book to be used as a toolkit. And we can go, we can go on vacation and see these very nostalgic photos of monuments and whatnot and leave it at that. Or we can critically deconstruct these photos and ask what we garner from them about what a better or sometimes worst city can be. And obvious venue here, I spend some time in the book in one of my own urban diary excerpts talking about what can be seen in this photo beyond just a tourist picture of the Eiffel Tower. And speaking of Paris, I like to say that the book is really in this mix of art and science that I alluded to earlier, a journey from the, pl the flanner that wandering, observant critic of change in 19th century Paris, all the way to the apps of today, including the Pokemon Go craze from last summer, and as you'll see, much, much more. Speaking of Paris, again, and Paris is a purposeful foil in this book because it's the most observed city in human history, I like to think. Uh, just as my hometown of Seattle is a foil in the book for how to deal with urban change. The book addresses change, and it's also a toolkit of how people, 
from regular folk all the way to elected officials and professionals can address change in their environment. Charles Baudelaire really sounded like the greatest NIMBY in the world in 1860 when he talked about the hospitalization of Paris and how the medieval city with which he was familiar and many were familiar was changing before everyone's eyes very, very quickly. And he made the great analogy to the scene, the swan and um, the strangulation by the long neck of the swan of historic Paris. I use this quotation to poke fun at some of some of our local pundits here in Seattle, where we're a very young city. And I like to point out that this is not the first time in human history that a human has had to deal with a changing urban environment. So along the way, for those of you who will be kind enough to purchase the book, get it free based on the next city promotion, or even read excerpts from Amazon and Google, along the way, I think we'll learn very quickly that to see is to think, and this is, of course, a borrowed term from many people, honoring the visual sense and honoring the fact that even the most um, wonky policy debates are often premised on visual stimuli. And so in this journey, we see things like color and the juxtaposition and overlays of many different forces in the city expressed visually. And I use this right now as one example of where the book will take a serious reader. It will also call upon everyone to think about the difference between the same physical construct across the world. In other words, a commercial street front. Arusha, Tanzania, note the Charles shop and not the Thomas shop. Sorry, Tom. Uh, and Seattle, Washington. And I like to open with these photos in many of my talks because I like to say, same city across the world, same forces at play, human commercial realities, the interface of weather and the city, the interface of transportation and the city, different approaches to infrastructure, different presentations based on culture, climate, and whatnot. But it's fun to note that there's a woman standing in just about the same place in both photos. So in all of this, it's highly contextual. It all depends on who's looking at what and from which angle. And I like to turn this on its head and force people to wonder why a homeless tent has got a great view in Seattle, the Seattle of today. Or why, on the right, we have so much argument about the sanctity of a single family neighborhood versus a multifamily dwelling and the prospect of duplexes and triplexes. This is my street in Seattle with a sixplex on the left, legally permitted about 20 years ago and a single family home on the right. They look very similar. Some people, if they think about the word only, will react to the sixplex. Sixplex, that's for some people a problematic word. But guess what? Don't tell anybody, all of you um, who are on the call, 310 people, but that house on the right is used for the storage of plumbing parts. So that just goes to my comment that I let off with, don't judge things by first impressions. There's really embedded stories that I would argue the visual sense causes one to think about. Very, very purposeful inquiry is what I'm talking about within the time space allowed. Um, and in doing that, I often harken back to the great New Deal era photographer in New York City, with whom some of you may be familiar, Berenice Abbott. She wrote a book that I'm looking at on my home office floor right now called Changing New York. Um, she came back from, again, Paris, um, right about the time of the beginning of the Great Depression. And New York had changed. And there was a lot of concern, just like there is today, about height, building height, skyscrapers, as they were called then. And she was one of the first advocates for the use of photography as a city planning tool. And 
in formulating her writing and her great visual essay, she pointed out, again, this, it all depends who's on lo looking at what from which angle. Uh, tall buildings can be beautiful, ugly, or both. And I riff off of her um, as um, I explore in chapter three of the book, How to Do an Urban Diary, and provide some examples that we, mu we may all respond to differently. The walkie-talkie building in London on the left, the Buffalo City Hall in the middle, and a couple of buildings in San Francisco on the right that some may say are beautiful, ugly, or both. Congruity versus reality in the city. So another thing that happens, and many of you on the call are well aware of this in today's urbanist battles about density, people really sometimes more on the, the NIMBY side, the no in my backyard side will say, oh, this new proposal isn't congruent, it's not compatible. Um, basically, I got a call a couple of years ago, a quick war story from a colleague who was looking for an expert witness on congruity relative to a new project next to an open space in downtown Seattle, let's just say. And it caused me to go on a bit of a tear because I, I really suggested, I gave him a name, but I really suggested that that term is a loaded term. And so I provide everyone on the call with an open question. Should we even ex congruity in a dense urban environment or is there another reality that really goes on in the changing city and maybe if we want congruity between humans and the built environment we should go to Iceland <laughs> and I say that with a little bit of snarky tone but I really mean it um, these are very very contextual arguments and these are the reasons that we need more than just words to illustrate what we mean when we respond positively or negatively to the urban uh, environment around us. It requires some form of immersion, some form of human observation, internalization, and response. And Paris again, Jacques Yonet, who was a reporter hiding out from the Nazis during World War II, talked about this, this immersion that one really needs to engage in to understand the city. And he he lived in places that he never dreamed he would because he had to. And he learned a tremendous amount about what a city really is. This photo was taken just about a year ago in the Marais in Paris, but it's timeless. And it communicates that immersion in sense-based imagery, I think, quite well. Another very important aspect is that Buildings in the city are their external representations, such as the Rem Coolhouse design downtown Seattle Public Library, but there are also the internal. And I caught this photo a, a few years ago to illustrate what I call the urban within and without. Um, and I speak to a quotation by the English author Jonathan Rabin, who talks about the soft city, the city of our dreams, our nightmares, and whatnot are impor as important, if not more important, than the physical city that surrounds us. And likewise, if we re get really into this, like some academics do in the sub-disciplines um, of psychogeography and place attachment, it's often possible to stand on a corner and look back in time if you know what the place used to be like. But someone else coming to that place may have no idea. And that raises the question of the role of storytelling, sometimes accomplished best through imagery to talk about a particular place. And why, in using the concept of age value, it may be important to honor something that was there before. No better place to see that, of course, than in Detroit. I also like to call out through images such as this one, what density really means, and a variety of urban qualities. And if this were an interactive presentation, I'd be asking the audience, well, what do you see here? But I always use this photo to ask about the different modes of transportation, the role of color, the role of um, time of day, the role of the um, um, wedding cake type uh, setbacks, 
uh, and so on and so forth, the role of the human activity um, in the lower left. And this is taking us towards that more visual language that I call for in the book. And guess what? This is in the island country of Malta, 60 miles south of Sicily. This is the most densely populated area of Europe. Most people don't know this, and it's more dense than most of our American cities, but take a look at it. And everybody's going to have a different response, but the point is we can all come together and discuss the qualities. And the way we do that is through the Urban Diary tool, which the book spends a lot of time on, and Jen Kinney wrote about that um, at the beginning of the month. And I'm going to fly through this a bit because you all can read this. You can, um, this, this actually is out there and some things that I've written. I'll mention one other publication. I am sorry, I apologize, Next City, but I did do a piece in Plan Edison yesterday where you can see um, a bit of this um, right there mentioned as well if you've not yet gotten to the book. So there's a simple model of Urban Diary as you're learning to ride a bicycle, play music, and so on and so forth. Um, and it offers this lens method, this acronym, um, which is a variable tool. It, it's scalable. It can be used for a very simple exercise such as this or all the way up to where a municipality is involved in some elicitation to compel citizenry to contribute in the ways I'm discussing. This is my neighborhood of Madrona in Seattle. Observation and input by people who live there is, of course, often, if not always the most authentic way to understand a place. And this is a neighborhood that's changing, as we can see through um, these gentlemen looking at a land use sign, and as we can see with regard to infill development that happened over the last um, couple of years. Finally, um, when we are observing locally, we can spend some time, and you don't need to go to Europe or Australia to do it, but on the left is in our Pike Pine area on Capitol Hill, a redevelopment known as Chop House Row, modeled on a Melbourne laneway on the right. Similarly, we see um, the opportunity to compare an American approach to um, balconies and presentation to the street with um, a French uh, shuttered approach in downtown Nice. Uh, we see the crescent of um, uh, Georgian England reflected uh, in uh, my neighborhood, comparing it to uh, Glasgow, Scotland. So these are the universal human patterns that um, we saw between Arusha and Seattle earlier. Um, the lens method, as I said, highly scalable, different type of diary types, can be thematic. Uh, we talked about the role of color, juxtapositions. Sometimes we follow a discrete path. Sometimes we wander. Sometimes we evoke the age value from that photo of Detroit. But we're always looking at people, aren't we? And um, some people would say never, never a photo without people. But then we can begin to use these photos to talk about whatever government plan, policy might be at hand, or private developers can use um, these, uh, these photos as well, thinking about um, perhaps crowdsourcing their project and, and, and creating a less opposition along the way. The lens method I used Recently, I went to Paris. I looked at the most ordered, um, uh, famous, uh, most 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 modeled after urban square in the world, the Place de Vosges, and I noted how every human activity could arguably be an incursion. And it called upon me to remember that some people like order, and maybe we search for that first, but some people really like organic change of the sort that so I've been alluding to. And you'll see under the archways in the Place des Vosges, which was once a live-work community 400 years ago, we see a homeless person in a box at night. So these issues are, are quite universal. I've tried this lens method out um, in Spokane um, to, the, to the east of Seattle, across the state, as many of you know. We took a walk, um, a land use advocacy nonprofit group and I took a walk uh, comparing a new uh, mixed-use development with an older neighborhood called West Central, where um, we were looking at how the city might change up its infill regulations to provide more uh, seamless 
renovation, uh, this, this case an old industrial building into a factory, but a great amount of effort went into a stormwater detention facility that people are standing on there that almost um, sunk the project. So we're talking about, we were talking about ways and use these visual cues as ways to think about how the city might um, facilitate redevelopment in a nicer way, a nicer user, more user-friendly way. There are three traps involved in observation, which I counsel against. I already alluded to them with regard to nostalgia. Think carefully of why you might like an environment. I've already alluded to the power of overlaps and overlays. The former formal word is juxtaposition. And then we saw that photo earlier, you know, where maybe, maybe we need to think differently about the homeless cri homelessness crisis and um, where it is that um, and how it is that we solve these issues and photography can play a major role. So in conclusion, I'm just going to run through some of the Chapter 5 stuff that is the more applied. And this gets to Tom's earlier question about technology versus something else. And on the left, a Google Street View photo. On the right, a photo that I took. Um, without bending your ear too much, let me just tell you that the personal photo on the right tells a far greater and more appropriate story to what and where this is, what's going on here and where this is, than a sort of removed uh, Google Street View photo that may just look like a suburb. Um, these are actually, this is actually a, a, a commercial zone, um, and these are the former demonstration houses of a post-World War II subdivision. Um, visual language in a rational world, back to that dichotomy that Tom set up. What I am arguing for is a, a central place, a safe place between not in my backyard and yes in my backyard, where the visual sense can drive common discussions about identified themes rather than just yes or no, or I like that, or I hate that. Um, we all have seen citizens try and use photography. The book counsels against using photography in a sugar-coated or misrepresentative way, and there's lots of tools about or lots of tips about how to do that. Um, but in the end, I'm really trying to institutionalize a pluralistic approach. And there's, a, there's many examples. An example of an individual in Raleigh who saw her neighborhood being replanned in a very straightforward and usual way. And she went back to the city and explained how um, historically people, from a cultural perspective, it's very important for them to congregate in the street, and um, I think she painted a whole new picture about what regulations there should look like. We, I have an example in a moment from Redmond, Washington, where the Urban Diary and a walk and talk workbook became a stakeholder building process. And of course, we received to some degree the new urbanism charrette approach and the democratic design movement and ecological democracy. Uh, I, you know, I'm not the first person to come up with um, public involvement or citizen participation. I'm trying to do it in today's world with the tools available. This is Redmond, Washington, where in replanning the downtown historic district, the city was trying to avoid this in the future. So we have the possibilities of social media as providing feedback and input along the way to designers. I have an example in the book about how an evocative photo of Cambodian fishermen entirely changed an aspect of the Seattle waterfront design. I talk about Adelaide, Australia, and how picture Adelaide 2040, simple photos with a narrative fed into a number of their ongoing plans. Talk about Austin, Texas, and Optica's designs work with the city that led to community character in a box, a kit shipped out to neighbors, telling them how to photograph but not what, they're telling them what to photograph, but not a value-laden approach, just toolkit for neighborhoods to submit sort of the types of things that I'm talking about. And then there's a wide range of apps that, um, that, that call upon us to do this. One of my favorites is Mappiness, a, um, a UK, United Kingdom app that asks people, where are you? How do you feel? Send a photo, and it pings folks' iPhone a few times a day. And then all this information is 
crowdsourced data mined and fed into neural networks that show that Jane Jacobs was right. <laughs> so anyway, we can change up the law to involve urban diaries, and I'm not expecting you to read this, but it shows you that there are indeed some practical applications to all of this. Um, and in the end, and I know I'm five minutes over, and I apologize for that, but in the end, the coffee table photo that is in the front of the book of Paris is there for a reason, because not only, as I said, is Paris the most studied city in the world in many respects, but I wanted to take on one of these Haussmann uh, avenues from the great Baron Haussmann, some people would say not great, um, who led the redesign and the redevelopment of Paris in the 1860s into the, the grander city that it is today. But this same photo, while on a coffee table, could also be fed into a neural network and spat back out to say, wow, people are really happy on the Place de la Paix in Paris today. So cultivate the visual, speak with more than words in times of urban change, try to understand this urban within and without, and the many cities, the many, many cities that we all see and we should respect in one another, and consider the urban diary as both a source of inspiration and also providing the prospect for an empowering and practical set of tools. So thank you for your patience with my extra five minutes. Chuck, thank you very much. That was a great presentation, and um, we appreciate you going to further detail on that. As I go through, I thought a couple of questions before we uh, open up to the audience. And one of the questions I had was, one of my favorite quotes is by Yogi Berra, the great Yankee baseball player and manager, who said, you can observe a lot just by watching. Now, Yogi had a lot of yogiisms as you go through, but there's quite a bit of truth to this. You hold that it is necessary to learn how to observe and liken it to learning to play a musical instrument. How complicated is it, and can anybody do it? I think it's something we all can do. We're all going to do it with varying levels of interest and devotion, but the landscape architecture professor Ann Whiston Spurn, as I quote in the book um, and was pointed to in a recent review of the book, says, never in human history have we taken so many photos and done so little with them. So that's the beauty of the smartphone. We Almost everyone has one, and everyone likes to take anything from selfies to Instagram photos of amusing things. And I think anyone can do it. And I think um, the book sets out, as you saw in the slides, a simple form of urban diary and a cascading set of more complicated ways to go about this that begin to feed into the technological side. But the visual sense, the, you know, the five senses haven't changed since the time of Aristotle. The visual is the most um, present and compelling. And I think, yeah, we have to. And in fact, when people don't like development around them, um, and they, they, they say, I don't like this new building next door, in a sense, that's already the road to an urban diary. What I especially appreciated is adding the visual element to um, what can be very dry and very complicated ordinances, plans, and regulations going through. I recall back 35 years ago when I was in graduate school, I studied um, at Rutgers under Professor Tony Nellison, who came up with a visual preference survey program and basically went around showing people slides, asking them what their preferences were. And ostensibly, people chose the places that were most livable. Then when you told them the density and the nature of the uses, et cetera, people said, oh, no, we can't allow that. That's not in our ordinances. Um, Tony used that technique to then actually write codes, ordinances, and a whole plan for Washington Town Center that today is a tribute to uh, neo-traditional planning. Um, so again, I, I'm a firm believer in this. And I think, again, what you've done by using and reminding folks that technology is there that 
almost anyone um, can start thinking a bit about how to do this. And then to use qualitative assessment through the diary is absolutely brilliant because it then reminds all of us that there is a humanistic approach to all of this and that qualitative and quantitative information uh, is critical to go through. Um, I have one question and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, you conclude your book by noting that most of us need to speak the language of our senses even in more ideally subdued places, such as City Hall. What advice would you give to mayors to encourage them to see the better city? <laughs> yes, I note, ideally subdued places such as City Halls. Um, we know they're not. Um, well, I'll give you a practical example here, here from Seattle. Um, first of all, I would say generally, though, that mayors should go out and do urban diaries themselves. And when I wrote the book, I wrote it with politicians in mind, especially those who haven't had a whole lot of exposure to land use issues. Um, so that links back to your other question about learning to ride a bicycle, play a musical instrument. I would tell a mayor, go out and try and do one of these things and take a critical look at your city and realize that there, you know, what, what better way to know that there's many cities all at once is to, you know, sort of force feed your own responses to yourself and then begin to talk about them. Secondly, I think um, some of what you just said from your graduate school experience, Tom, is very important. Um, that uh, it, you know, mayors should be sure that their planning staffs appreciate the visual as a driver of public participation, and that they think critically about their public involvement sessions and so on and so forth. And as I told Jen in, um, when she interviewed me for Next City, you know, here in Seattle, we're not there yet. We are trying so hard to provide new, as are many cities, new platforms for web-based meetings and so on and so forth. But oftentimes, there's a value judgment inherent in the end product of plan, policy, or regulation. And so at least along the way, find a way for that safe space that also involves more, more than visual preference, more than sticky notes on the photos you like. But how about real participation and submittal um, by, by people who live in a place? And we've got to figure out how to do that in particular contexts. My brief Seattle example is, um, you'll recall the photo of my street and the sixplex and the single family um, um, house next door that isn't used as a single family house. Uh, we had a lot of uh, adventure when our mayor's housing and livability agenda was rolled out in the summer of 2015 because there people were focusing just on words and that there was a sort of misunderstanding that the inclusion of multifamily within certain single-family neighborhoods or on the edge of single-family neighborhoods closer to transit was going to upend single-family zoning entirely. And so from that comes my final advice that is a really practical illustration of why uh, a better illustrated report probably would have saved some of the heartburn that the city first went through because the words communicated different things to different people. And I believe firmly, given that one of the journalists who fostered um, questions lives right up the hill from me, had he taken a walk down the hill, he might not have written the same article that he did. We've got a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll raise a couple of those. Um, Colin Welsh asks, did you follow the Proposition Neighborhood Integrity Initiative in LA? And do you have any insight or opinion on the failed effort? Um, you know what? I am aware of that only by its title. And so I guess I would have to say uh, not entirely. Um, I do not know the details. Um, I think that these things, I will say, presuming that it sounds like it didn't work, just like our in Seattle, some of our outreach relative to the housing and li livability agenda have not worked. Um, I, you know, the generic 
two-bit advice, and I don't want to seem like I know what I'm talking about, and, and, and you know, and, and helicopter in and, and, and be glib, because I do not like people who do that. Uh, but I will say that this is a highly, highly contextual undertaking. It won't work everywhere. And people really need to think through what's going on, and maybe there are situations that um, allowing a free reign, you know, submittals is not going to work very well. But, and that's not really what I'm advocating for. I'm trying to provide a scalable approach that can be adapted to different um, contextual situations. But I'm sorry, Colin, that I do not know the details of, um, of that um, approach, and perhaps I, I should. <laughs> well, it's something we can keep track, we can follow up and, as we go through. Um, Elaine Erb asks, part of the dissatisfaction with growth and density in our community is that the new buildings are boring, cookie-cutter structures. When there are so many local regulations, the developers have little incentive to make buildings interesting or attractive. Do you have any advice on how we can encourage more intriguing architecture? Yeah, that's a very common, that's a very common uh, problem, and we um, have certainly seen it just about everywhere, and I think that um, there's a range of tools that create that often present their own problems, um, both legal and procedural, such as design review, um, historic districts, um, a more um, a more uh, um, you know incentive-based approaches to retain uh, local character, and then there's the whole uh, form-based code approach. Um, and so that it's a, it's a difficult question to answer in just a few minutes, but I will say one thing that um, I'll give you an example of a of a neighborhood here um, that I'm familiar with in Seattle called the Pike Pine Overlay, which really tried to honor a long the long history. And this sounds very unappetizing, but let's let's you know at, at first glance, but um, in this particular part of Seattle um, was once the largest set of um, ornate automobile showrooms uh, west of the Mississippi or some such thing. And we can say what we will about the role of the automobile. That's not the point. It presented a certain character, district character, of, of big windowed facades and um, ornate brick or terracotta um, the type of thing that we don't want with the blank wall boxes or, or, or whatever that I think we're alluding to here. And what Seattle did is through a, a, a long, interactive, tweaked process, they created overlay incentives that allowed a bit more height for the preservation of facade character. And a, a lot of pure preservationists don't like this approach because they call it facademy or facadectomies and so on and so forth. But I think to really solve the types of issues that um, that Elaine raised, we're going to need to get again highly con contextual, and this is not a one size fits all uh, um, situation. Although the problem is definitely very very common, so I think we all need to ratchet up a role for the visual in whatever way makes sense in our in our particular cities and towns, and it it may not be easy. It may not be easy and it may not work at first, but um, I think our systems are often broken and do need to change in this direction. You mentioned in the book both the rational approach and view. Um, how important is the irrational and emotional, and how might this be considered? Um, it certainly seems reactions from photo views can be highly emotional, says Ralph McNeze. So, uh, right. again, uh, you deal with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, yes, I think that that's exactly the point. But so often, um, so often in our legislative regulatory processes around our country, so often do we give lip service to affected populations without a full range of expression of their um, concerns. And so I would agree with you 
and I, I guess I would say that, and, and look, I, I have done more work as a lawyer on the development side than I have um, for neighborhood groups. Okay. And a lot of developers would welcome an irrational response initially because they want to have that safe space conversation, the storytelling conversation between the continuum of NIMBY and YIMBY, yes, in my backyard. And quite frankly, a lot of the book talking about that safe space and talking about storytelling, you know who it came from? A sensitivity towards indigenous populations in the United States and Australia and from developers. And so I think that the emotional response is fine and we just need to keep working, especially in this day and age, on local voices and how to foster um, some sense of um, uh, civic dialogue without being um, forced to think about ways in which there needs to be security at a, at a given um, design review meeting because the neighbors are so upset. Right. Louise Cannon asks, where have you seen examples of bottom-up initiatives where there is will from citizens to engage in local placemaking, but limited engagement and support at a city level for multiple reasons? Any examples of best practice to co-produce plans? And I guess when I read through chapter five, I saw a number of examples, include the six examples from Canada, Australia, and the U.S. Would you mind maybe citing one or two of those and uh, be able to answer questions? Yeah, this is where you really want to say, go buy the book. It's in Chapter 5. But, That's right. <laughs> or how about join Next City for $60 and get the book for free? How's that, Tom? But anyway, all kidding aside, I think, um, that, you know, that happens. And... Um, there are examples in the book. I think one uh, really cool example um, is um, again. I have Seattle. You know, I have far more than Seattle examples. Believe me, in the book. But one example for in Seattle, um, where a um, one of the early integrated public housing projects in the United States, Yesler Terrace, has been essentially redesigned on a public-private basis, mixing. Uh, commercial and residential uses, but uh, preserving the affordability thereof. And there's a, um, a few paragraphs in the book about the use of the photo voice tool, which has been around for a long time, started with disposable cameras, um, often used with children, or the homeless, for that matter. And um, every summer for several years, a partnership of um, the Seattle Housing Authority the city of Seattle and Seattle University created um, the opportunity for um, affected kids in who lived in Yesler Terrace to, to produce photos and even videos um, talking about how change was impacting them. And so that's that's one example. There certainly um, is the Austin example that um, I mentioned, pioneered by Opticos Design, uh, Dan Parallack and Karen Parallack out of California, uh, the community character in a box idea. I did mention that already. Um, Adelaide, Australia has taken great lengths to champion um, placemaking as part of its planning strategies. And uh, again, I would refer you to picture Adelaide 2040. Uh, there are, uh, there are um, often times, if it's not government who's not receptive, um, sometimes the marketplace is not receptive, although more and more the marketplace is um, receptive because they know that livable places make money, livable, walkable places make money. And so um, there are often examples of developers, as I said earlier, who want to engage, even if there's not a government process to do so, they want to engage in this storytelling um, as part of their projects. And I commend to you in Chapter 5 some, some TED Talks by uh, the architect Mark Kushner, who talks about the interactive design that can be achieved through, um, through the use of social media and bouncing um, prospective designs out there. His goal is always, when working on a large project, to engage the public such that by the time they visit the finished building, they feel like they've already been there. But again, they, you know, there's the end of chapter two, 
Chapter 5, there's tons of examples, both in the text and the notes, of existing tools that have been used uh, uh, around the world. I, I was especially thrilled to see the uh, information on Adelaide and on Melbourne in Australia. Um, Adelaide's storytelling, of course, as you're going through, and then um, Melbourne's urban forest strategy, fascinating. But I thought the Abbotsford, British Columbia um, example about the update to the official community plan, and in particular, the Albany 2030 uh, plan that you identified, where it's the first comprehensive plan in Albany's 400-year history, is amazing. And one of the ways to go about doing that is a citizen journal, which allowed citizens to use photos, text, and videos uh, to describe opinions about Albany, um, was really amazing. So I would second your point that People should buy the book. Um, <laughs> yeah. City, find out more about this. And let me conclude with a question from um, one of our uh, viewers, uh, Paige Anderson, who asked, do you have any advice for aspiring urbanists, planners, and designers hoping for a career that engages with qualitative research? Um, um, yeah, I love questions like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say if if you know if you know, and I, Paige, we don't know exactly where you are in your in your education, but um, if you know that this stuff motivates you and you feel some passion about it, um, that's great. And so many of us, myself included, you know, had a whole basis to start at age twelve <laughs> or younger and go forward with this in a way that I chose not to do. I chose to look at what was accepted in the world at a time not different than right now. Ronald Reagan was president. It didn't seem a very good time to go off after I got my history degree at the University of Washington and my planning degree at Cornell. It didn't seem like a great time to become a passionate humanist about cities because you know the government in DC looked like it wasn't going to be very supportive so I went off and became a lawyer look what happened it all caught up with me again so I think that be true to um, be true to your interests what motivates you and take a, if you're looking for instance to go to graduate school Take a hard look at the programs that seem to honor your interests. Don't feel like you just have to go to an Ivy League school or a top 10 school just because you feel like it'll be better for your job uh, search later. That sometimes can be very, very short-sighted because you lose the passion that's really driving you. And the idea, again, that photography and other visual skills uh, can be both complementary and perhaps even career enhancing, if you can figure out a way to connect the dots. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, I think, uh, again, not to over-tout Next City, but I think that <laughs> that's, that's part of my job here. But, but I think that Jen's article um, in Next City really shows someone who has married um, both photography with her journalism and um, urban expertise and it shows what can happen when a person brings all three to the table and so I I thought it, again I thought her article was just fascinating not because it was about seeing the better city but just because of the way she chose to to write the article and illustrate it herself not with photos from the book but with her own drive across Philadelphia uh, one night um, so for folks that are looking, that's Use Your Camera Like a City Planning Tool. We published on March 2nd, and it's at nextcity.org. So thank you again, Chuck Wolf. This has been fascinating. And thank you, Matt, for an Island Press for allowing us to have this webinar. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. And it's been, a, it's been a great honor to participate. So thanks to both Island Press and Next City once again. I really, really appreciate it. I hope everyone learned something along the way. <laughs> great. Well, thank you again very much, Tom and Chuck. Uh, great conversation. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in and who asked questions. Uh, I know we, we weren't able to get to every single question. You had so many, but we really appreciate the uh, participation. Uh, before you go, I just want to remind you, uh, you can get 
Chuck's book, Seeing the Better City, for 20% off. Uh, go to islandpress.org and use the promo code 4WOLF uh, at checkout. And um, be sure to, one more slide here, sorry. Uh, and uh, check out nextcity.org uh, slash membership if you'd like to become a Next City member. Uh, again, thanks to Tom D'Alessio, CEO and publisher of Next City. Uh, Chuck Wolf, uh, author, land use lawyer, taking part in the webinar. Thanks for all my, uh, to all my colleagues at Island Press. Uh, before you go, there's a, when you sign off of GoToWebinar, there is a very short survey. It takes about two minutes. Um, please take the time to fill that out. We appreciate your input. Um, and so the, do that if you can. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a very good day. This is Matt from Island Press, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.